conspiracy influencers, conspiracy, um, you know, fabulists, they are kind of a doppelganger of investigative journalism. Like the, they use the conventions, the containers, the lingo, but they leap over the guardrails that good investigative journalism and good academic research has to make sure that you check yourself, right? You, that you show your work, that just because it feels true doesn't mean you have proved it. I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is the writer and activist Naomi Klein, author of the highly influential and best-selling books, including No Logo, The Shock Doctrine, and the new book Doppelganger, A Trip into the Mirror World. Like all of her books, it's an accessible yet complex work of socioeconomic and political criticism, but it is also funny at times disturbing, deeply rooted in the author's personal experience. But for any of us that spend time online or with a steady diet of media, it can feel joltingly familiar. Naomi Klein, welcome to Kobo. Thank you so much, Michael. This is a book that starts by being about confusion, about semi-mistaken identity, mix-ups that aren't unsurprising in the churn of social media between you and another person, a double, a doppelganger. I've always been pretty clear on who you are on your writings and career, but that's less about me being smart or good with names. And there's plenty of evidence against both, um, but more because we live in similar worlds, the world of bookstores and publishing and academics and well-researched media, where knowing the difference between two authors and what they've written is kind of a point of pride. This book, in a lot of ways, is about stepping out of that world and what it's like to immerse yourself in a completely different world with a different set of values and rules. So to talk about that, can we start with the situation that, that began this whole story? You being confused with the author, Naomi Wolf, the author of The Beauty Myth. You know, the truth is, I'm interested that you say that you, you know you you didn't confuse us because you're in the same world because I'm not sure that that I think you should give yourself a little bit more credit because I've most certainly heard people in media like in even a little in publishing maybe not quite as much but I think it doesn't happen to me as much in Canada um, because I grew up in public here, like people kind of know, have a, a more fixed idea of who I am. But when I go to the UK, um, uh, it happens, it, it, it happens a lot more, uh, a, 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 including in like a more bookish world. Um, and I think the first time it happened to me in person, I did, I wasn't 100% sure it was happening. But in retrospect, I realized it was happening, which is, I was on book tour in Australia. And I met this very famous, fancy Australian author that I won't name, um, and, and, we, and my my publisher introduced us, and and I said, "Nice to meet you. It's an honor." And then he was like, um, "Yeah, we spent quite a bit of time at that Random House Christmas party in London." And I was like, "What?" I was, I, and he just was having none of it. Like he's like, "We clearly had had quite a moment at this party in London that I never went to." <laughs> I was really puzzling over it later, and I was like. I think you thought I was Naomi Wolf. Um, but yeah, the first time I was absolutely sure <laughs> was I was in a public restroom in New York. It was during Occupy Wall Street. And I overheard two women uh, trashing an article I had written. Uh, and I was in the stall and I and they were like, did you hear what Naomi Klein wrote? And I, and, and I was just like flooded with, with, with mean girl terror. What had I written? What had I done? And then I, I realized that they were describing an article that I had read, but not written by Naomi Wolf. So I came out and I said, I think that you're talking about Naomi Wolf. And I have needed to make that correction hundreds of times on the internet since, which is kind of like this overhearing conversations on in a in a public restroom. You both kind of came up in your careers around the same time, or at least in the same decade. Her writing about women and feminism, you writing about the impact of commerce and capitalism and branding on our lives and our planet. And and so it seems like there's, you know, as you say, there's always been this kind of background noise you know, there. But throughout the book, you explore this idea of the doppelganger, the person who is 
my double, my alter ego, my twin or my evil twin. At what point did she go from just being kind of a name of, you know, with some confusion to it, to that other, to be other Naomi? Um, so, I mean, to be honest, I would mostly only hear about the confusion when she did something that was kind of off. So I would say, you know, I read in the book that she, she had been dabbling in conspiracy culture for a good decade. Um, you know, things like 5G, you know, chemtrails. Uh, she would claim that ISIS beheadings were crisis actors. She would claim that, you know, the woman, like she, she had, she had conspiracies about theories about Edward Snowden, about Dominique Strauss-Kahn, the former head of the IMF. Um, so I would go online and then I would see like people being upset about something that I had done. And then I would have to reverse engineer it. Like, well, sh what has she done now? You know, <laughs> because I, like, I didn't know it was. I'm like, oh, okay. She said she posted about clouds again. I get it. Okay. Um, so I, I guess I'm saying it was, wasn't fun <laughs> uh, for, mm -hmm. for a while uh, leading up to COVID when it became a lot more serious. Um, and it became more serious because she became one of the most significant vectors for misinformation and disinformation about the virus, about the health measures to control the virus, um, about the vaccines, um, and still is. Uh, and so, you know, I think medical misinformation is a major cause of death um, at this point in history. And so if people thought that I was the one saying that vaccinated people shed vaccine particles onto unvaccinated people just by being in the same room as them, or maybe not even being in the same room at the same time, and, and it caused uh, disruptions to their menstrual cycle, which is things that she has said, mm -hmm. then, then, then the stakes of that were a little bit higher. But I think, I think the, the other thing is that it, the confusion became much more frequent during COVID, and that was because the structure of her claims uh, uh, kind of rhymed with the shock doctrine in the sense that she was saying that the pandemic was, so the so for people who aren't aware, the shock doctrine is a book I wrote, it came out in 2007, and it is about real examples of governments using states of emergencies to push through very unpopular uh, um, policies that they wouldn't be able to, to push through under normal times. Um, like after Hurricane Katrina, privatizing the school system and, and bulldozing public housing and replacing it with condos. Not, not um, kind of sensational conspiracy theories of the kind that we hear these days, but just kind of straight up capitalist opportunism. And that's what the shock doctrine was about. But it is about exploiting states of shock and, and doing so deliberately, not causing the shocks, but deliberately exploiting them. And, um, and, and, and a lot of the conspiracies that were swirling around COVID had that sort of structure, but like, as I say, with all the facts and evidence removed, like the idea that, oh, this whole, this whole pandemic was cooked up by the Davos elites in order to lock us in our homes so that they could X, Y, Z, you know? And so I think that because like having a Naomi out there making an argument like that on Fox got pretty, I understand why people were confused, you know? And so it was, it was uncanny as Freud would say, you know, where something is just like familiar, but different, right? And as you say, you're the the dynamic between you becomes especially apparent when you're far apart from each other. When she's you know talking about you know vaccines turning other people sterile or making people lose their smell, um, but also when you get kind of almost close enough to touch. You know, you both had disagreements with Bill Gates. You had disagreements about completely different things, but it's just that close enough that it creates that. Yeah, you know, that sense of elision. How do you describe the ideological territory that she inhabits right now? So she's one of a small, but not insignificantly small group of high profile liberals and leftists who crossed over to the, um, you know, I say the far right, the Bannon right, the MAGA right, um, uh, in recent years. Um, 
So what is what is this ideological terrain? In the book, I use a term called diagonalism, which <laughs> comes from uh, it's it's a phrase used by uh, political theorists um, Quinn Slobidian um, and William Callison, who studied Germany in particular, and were looking at lock, the lock, the emergence of these big lock anti lockdown protests in Germany that brought together some far right parties and a lot of kind of um, wellness entrepreneurs. Um, the uh, people who they describe as movement hustlers, like basically people in it, like to sell something, to sell T-shirts, to sell subscriptions. Um, people who were really interested in how like technology and politics could merge. Um, uh, it combines these elements of like spiritualism, holism, but reliably arcs to the far right. And there's a real fetish for like individual liberties over any kind of collective good a profound suspicion of any institution, of any kind of organized power and seeing it all as conspiracy. Um, it's pretty incoherent, um, but I think there actually is more coherence towards this new con political configuration. And I put new kind of in air quotes because I think there are familiar figures at the center of it, like Steve Bannon, who are really good at picking, you know, a, kind of bring, doing a kind of mix and match between the more conventional um, platform of the far right, like fortress borders or what he calls border warfare um, and, uh, and, you know, very pro-police, very pro-military, um, uh, a kind of monsterizing of the black quote unquote inner city um, and, and you know, adding to that the like a real focus on uh, anti-transness, this idea that like there's all these groomers trying to like turn your kids trans. Um, and he saw opportunities in the anti-vax, anti-mask world to mix and match. And the, when I say there's some coherence, a lot of it has to do with this idea of like purity and in particular, like protecting like the, the purity of the child and also the purity of the nation from all of these invaders, right? So you've got this like pure, this idea of like the pure child, often the pure white child, but not exclusively. Um, and the kind of the nostalgic idea of the pure homeland that is under threat. It's under threat from immigrants. It's under threat from vaccines and these poisonous vaccines. It's under threat from these teachers who are telling your kids these wrong histories, these painful histories of your, that are the real histories of your countries. It's under threat from drag queens at the library. Like, but like this is, uh, there's a coherence and at the heart of it is this idea of, 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 of protecting purity and it's a very dangerous one. And this, this project that Steve Bannon represents is something that you explore in a fair bit of detail and, and kind of gets you onto familiar ground in in terms of you know your beat of politics and policy and economics one thing that you describe so well is how wolf fits into this much larger project mm -hmm. and the shifting political landscape that bannon and peak like him represent and specifically the mobilization of women to this you know to this movement and the leveraging of of her you know, kind of historical bona fides as a feminist towards that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, which is why it's really important to understand how central the figure of the child is, right? Because you know, Bannon is an electoral strategist, and he knows that the reason why the Republicans have lost the last couple of elections is because they are not able to appeal to women in the same way that they are able to appeal to men um, who had formerly voted Democrat, right? So he was able to peel away some union members who were very rightfully angry, I would argue, at the Democratic Party who had promised to do something about free trade and then flip-flopped over and over again. Um, and he is trying to do something similar now with women. And that's what she represents to him. He really, I mean, he has her on the show sometimes every single day. They co-published an ebook together. Like they really, it's one of the strangest buddy movies of all time. I mean, it's a pretty intense transformation if you think about who she was in the 90s, you know, um, and, and even after, I mean, more recently in 2007, she published a book that was explicitly anti-fascist. And here she is 
in cahoots with, you know, with, with somebody who I has a project that I think is absolutely fair to call at least neo-fascist. Um, he is, you know, when he left, when he was pushed out of Trump's White House, he immediately set out to weave together this international network of the farthest right parties in Europe, you know, Victor Orban, Fratelli d'Italia, which is had another prime minister is now, you know, um, uh, Giorgio Malone, uh, the AFD in Germany, uh, Bolsonaro in, in 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 Brazil. He calls it like the nationalist international, um, but it is a fascist project, and it's extraordinary that she, somebody who wrote a book about how to keep your society from tipping into fascism, would be you know in league with him, um, you know, and that she would be fine to be on a, on on shows that celebrated the overturning of Roe v. Wade and when she, when asked about it said well maybe it's a state decision you know this is you know one of the one of the most prominent feminists of her generation she also was passionately anti-gun and now she takes pictures of her gun and warns of civil war so i do think it is a transformation and i think we have to to understand how dramatic it is because she's not the only one who is changing very dramatically right mm -hmm. and the doppelganger in literature often stands in for these moments when people become unrecognizable to us right and, and, you know, and that's why they're often used as a literary vehicle to sort of wrap one's head around fascism, right? Those moments when suddenly a society changes into this fascistic version of itself and suddenly the, you know, your, 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 your friendly neighbors are a mob and suddenly the nice kid down the street is marching, you know, in, in goose step. Yeah, I guess to, to, to dig into that a bit, it, something it seems like we are lazy about in the media, in the left wing or progressive circles, is is how we sometimes invoke like mental illness when someone leaves our system of beliefs for something else. Mm -hmm. You know, she went crazy and became an anti vaxxer. He yeah. swallowed the red pill and now he's paranoid about the government. But one of the things you do such a good job of in this book is showing that, you know, Wolf's mental wellness notwithstanding, I, she's acting very much according to a set of rules for the media landscape that she has uh, that she has gone into. It's just a very different landscape and a very different set of rules than the one that she was inhabiting before, and that she's kind of functioned like a heat-seeking missile getting closer and closer to those places that were hottest yeah. and now finds herself, you know, kind of in the beating heart of this thing. Yeah. So I, I really do try not to use the word crazy. I don't think it's in the book. I, I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to do an armchair diagnosis here, you know, I, and, and I also think there's a kind of a mania to our culture um, in general. And it's not about that. Like I want to understand what the rewards are mm -hmm. um, and what the incentives are, what the drivers are. And, you know, whatever her mental state, what she's done is worked for her. It just from the measures of, you know, kind of conventional online success, follower count, uh, uh, subscribers, um, you know, the ability to monetize. It's, it's, it's a successful mo business model. Um, and she's not the only one who is pursuing this particular business model. And I think that in, in trying to understand why conspiracy culture is taking off in the way that it is and, and, you know, began, like maybe it really took flight during COVID, but it is not, you know, it didn't, is, isn't ending there, um, is that we are living through a period of serial shocks of different kinds. They're coming closer and closer together. Events that we perhaps never thought we would see are happening. And with the climate crisis, we're going to have more and more of them. Um, and people are going to be looking around for some kind of an explanation. And when that search and those shocks meet the attention economy, then you're able to monetize the most um, you know, the most sort of extreme theory that seems to make sense of the world. So conspiracy theories during times of crisis are not new. I've seen it, you know, during every shock and disaster I've covered, and I've been covering them for a really long time, but I've never seen an industry around them until COVID. This is in so many ways a, a pandemic story. You know, there is you sitting at home in lockdown on an island off the coast of British Columbia. There is other Naomi's 
learning to surf this rising tide of disinformation about vaccines and mask mandates and vaccine passports. As a person who is a specialist in understanding systemic shocks, how they create opportunity for people who can exploit disruption to gain power. Were you aware of the shocks that you were experiencing and that were disrupting you while they were happening as you were living through it? Did you have the moments of, oh, this is what it feels like when Mm -hmm. the world turns upside down? Yeah, definitely I did. And and it was it def it made me it hum it was humbling in the sense that I think I've always sort of prided myself on being somebody who can stay calm in 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 moments of shock. You know, I I I, I yeah I've, I reported from war zones and and natural disasters and and um and I you know I, I what I realized during COVID was. Th- even though I would may have been physically there in Iraq or New Orleans or Sri Lanka after the tsunami, like it was not my shock. I was there as a reporter with my notebook or camera and, and it, you know, it wasn't my home that was swept away. It wasn't, you know, my kid's school that was being shut down, um, you know, while I was evacuated and, and, you know, I've always written about how those states are cynically exploited, the states of confusion, the emergency, the just getting through the day and how that it's in that state that that so many of uh, you know corporate and political actors will just move in to try to get their wish list te- checked off. But, you know, I had a foggy brain in those early months and I was trying, you know, to, to homeschool my kid and you know, I was, at, you know, I was, we were in the States when in the first few months of the pandemic in one of the hotspots um, near New York. And, you know, having grown up in the Canadian healthcare system, like just the absolute dysfunction of, of, of U.S. hospitals dealing with, 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 with those co- the COVID surges, it was just, we were just so incredibly scared of ending up in the hospital. We both got sick, you know, me and Abby. So like, I, you know, I put out some writing and, you know, how to protect yourself from the pandemic shock doctrine and all that. And we did lots of podcasts and all that, but I don't believe like my, like, I'm not proud of how I was able to, you know, keep my own focus. And I thought, well, it, in a way, it's a kind of a writing challenge of like, how do you write about shock from like inside it? Like, how do you write about a hurricane from it inside the hurricane? Right. And, and having written a lot about shocks from the outside, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll try writing about it from the inside, like actually try to capture the feeling of that destabilization. You know, people read the book, they're like, wow, you were really screwed up. And I'm like, I may have been leaning into it a little bit for a literary effect, you know, like, <laughs> like I had to establish myself as a destabilized narrator so that we can get to stable ground together. But I was, you know, I was genuinely destabilized because that destabilization was then layered on top of this identity confusion and um, of, of, you know, going online and, and having thousands of people tell me, think I was somebody else. And yeah, that's when I realized, well, this is actually material. And once I realized it was material, it was just be, became really quite rich. Like then I was really happy, like every time it happened, like instead of being horrified, like I can't believe people thought of me like that. Then then I was like, oh, this is this is good. I'm going to write this one down. <laughs> well, there there is a lot of you in this in order to understand what is happening with other Naomi, you have to spend more and more time in her media landscape, in her world, listening to Steve Bannon podcasts and anti-vax, reading anti-vaxxer websites. And this started to become a point of friction in your personal life. Yes, well, well, Avi, my husband is a character in the book. He's got it. He's, he's very good natured about it. He's a good sport. Um, but yeah, I, a friend of mine read the book and she said, I feel like Avi walks in every hundred pages and says, really? <laughs> So he's a bit of my foil, you know, but it is all true. I think he he really he 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 jokes that like for months every time he walked into a room that I was in by myself, I would just lunge for my phone to turn off what I was listening to because I was so embarrassed. You were shame listening Steve Bannon. Yeah, yeah, I didn't want to explain it, you know. Like I was just just like I was listening to Steve Bannon. I was also listening to some really good podcasts that were make try that were also trying to make sense of this world like QAnon Anonymous which is a which is a really funny podcast um of 
it's got three or four hosts depending on the week where they where they go to q anon events and things like that and basically just mainly they just laugh at it but they do do real analysis like i learned from them that canada had a queen i didn't know canada had you know the q anon queen ramana didalo but um i thought it was interesting that i didn't know about it till these americans told me about ramana didalo and then then we all learned about her but yeah, so I would listen to that. I would also listen to Conspirituality, which is a really great podcast about the intersection of wellness and conspiracy culture and fascism. And as you were in it, and as we were all in the pandemic, you know, what was that doing to, to your mental state? I mean, you were already grappling with this sense of people mixing you up with another person who's gone to an extremely different ideological place, but you're also taking this very steady bath in extremism and alternate facts that that, that world feeds on. Um, how would you feel coming out of that? Could you keep that kind of remove that you keep when you go to a war zone and then step back out again? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I see all of my books back to no logo as sort of attempts to map the moment. Um, and that's is how I, I find my own, you know, semblance of sanity and, and, and how I, you know, have, a, have a feeling of kind of intellectual stability, you know, I do that mapping of, you know, where we are now. And, and this had to be a weirder map, because it is a weirder moment. But the experience of writing it was very steadying. And I did begin it in a very sort of destabilized vertig vertiginous state that I maybe play up a little bit for literary effect, but it was real. Um, but, you know, mapping, okay, so what is Steve, Bannon, what does Steve Bannon get from her? Like, I get what she gets from him, she gets a whole new audience. But what does he get from her? Why is he important to that political project? Right? Um, why are these people um, you know, say like saying the opposite of what we thought that 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 they believed. Why are left right political signals getting so mixed up? What did the left do wrong to make this you know possible? Um, you know, so there's a lot of self criticism in the book, but all of it forms a kind of a map of 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 the way things have changed. And you know, I've been really gratified to hear from a lot of readers that they've found that it's given people language, you know, like a lot of people are using this phrase, the mirror world to understand the sort of these sort of weird alliances, um, where you'll have like a figure like Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, standing with code pink against the war in Ukraine, like, that's not something you thought you would see, right? So, so uh, I'm always, you know, I, I feel like all of my books have a very humble role <laughs> to play, which is I feel like I try to help people read the newspaper better. <laughs> like just have a few like little frames and maybe some language to name things so that we can be more critical consumers of the news so that we can be more responsible participants in, you know, in our polities. And, you know, the shock doctrine, I think, did play that role for a time, I, and to some extent still does. And and I'm really gratified to see Doppelganger, you know, beginning to to have that life in the world as people read it. One of the additional services that I think you provide as a part of this, though, is is mapping out um, the you know the Maga Plus project in terms of its it's occupying of unused political spaces or neglected political spaces and the you know that ability to find those underserved populations or those neglected populations and pull them into a political program what i'm interested in is as you as you look at it from the from kind of the progressive side of of the conversation what do you see the corresponding evolution needing to be on the left to counteract that? Yeah, that's the big question. And that's been, you know, mainly what I have found myself kind of talking about. And, you know, when I was on tour with the book and mm -hmm. rooms full of people, most of whom are lefties because they're out there to see me, you know, <laughs> I mean, but my message was like, I'm not the only one with a doppelganger. The left has a doppelganger. And it's this ways in which that, the, that uh, ways that our, parts of our uh, of the left kind of platform have, are being co-opted and mixed and matched. And, you know, m what I believe about Steve Bannon is you can't blame a strategist for being strategic, and it is highly strategic 
to take issues that your opponents have left unattended and underused and that but but have significant popular appeal and fold them into your other issues and that's what mm-hmm. he has done he doesn't do it out of belief you know he doesn't rail against big pharma and big tech out of belief in my opinion he does it um because he sees that these are issues that are concerning people and that the democrats are once again not doing anything with them are too close to silicon valley too close to the pharmaceutical companies and you know he can he can exploit that so you know my message to the left is like we have to be the left like we actually have the way to fight fascism is to tell a story um about power that isn't about scapegoating a group of individuals um but it explains to people how systems work and that's always been the role of the left right that's why anti-semitism is you know has been called since the 1800s the socialism of fools because it is a foolish theory of how power works it is saying uh, it, you know the reason why you're poor is because of that guy over there you know who wants to take his pound of flesh not that this is a system that is built to disenfranchise you and so this kind of dialectic between the conspiracy theorist the scapegoater and all conspiracy theories are scapegoats stories and you know a systemic analysis of capitalism we you know we have been in this in this wrestling match you know of the hearts and souls for a really long time which is why i reject you know flatly horseshoe theory like i don't believe that this is about the left and right meeting at their furthest fringes you know i think there is a very strong role um for a, you know a, a a marxist left to put it frankly um where i think we we see this diagonalism is really with you know when i say in the book the far out and the far right like the far out left the sort of new age um uh, um kind of like a left that is mostly about kind of feelings about wanting to be natural and wanting you know to be kind of like like pure um and the way that that kind of rhymes with a right agenda uh you know around kind of purity of nation purity of of bodies many of us know people at a more personal level who have one way or another ended up mentally ideologically in that mirror world you know they've incorporated some of that overlapping set of beliefs now so many families have that set of topics that they just can't bring up at thanksgiving dinner or that they skip when shared by an aunt or a brother or a friend on social media people talk about not knowing how to get someone back or having lost them. And yeah. as you've now spent a lot of time in that world, what do you think about those situations? Um one of the things that drives people into this world, I have a little equation in the book that I've um used about like what sort of drives people to to into the world is like narcissism/grandiosity plus social media addiction plus midlife crisis divided by public shaming equals right wing meltdown um and the public shaming piece is pretty important i also think it applies to private shaming i think there were a lot of ruptures in families during covid because we were scared you know we were all scared and so you know that cousin or uncle who didn't get vaccinated or you know um wasn't stop being invited to those family dinners and so on because people were afraid they didn't know if that would, was going to make them more vulnerable there was a lot of confusing health information i think for a while it was true then it stopped being true um so i think there's a lot there are a lot of relationships that can be rebuilt um shaming is never a great idea <laughs> um you know one of the most gratifying reactions to the book that i've gotten are like um i get i've gotten some letters and heard from people who say that they've reached out to a sister or a uncle um or a father-in-law uh who they had cut relations uh with and had some ideas about ways that they might be able to extend a bridge right like i also disagree uh, that you know i also think big pharma is terrible and here's another way that we might deal with you know what they're doing like how about pharma care <laughs> you know um i don't think it's always going to work but it's definitely clear from the social science on this that if somebody is going to come back from these very extreme positions it's going to be because somebody who they love 
have have some kind of trusting pre-existing trusting relationship um, does extend some sort of a bridge that they can walk over. It's not going to be because they read my book um, because they won't read my book. They're pre they are pre defended against it. Um, they've already been told I'm part of the Davos elite globalist plot, you know, which may come as a surprise to some of your listeners. At least I hope it is. Um, and but 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 it it could be the friend from high school, you know. It could and and I think some people are probably too far gone, but not everyone. Um, so you know, I, I I'm always happy when I hear those stories, but I also want to be honest that I don't think that that we're going to solve this one one uncle at a time. You know, I do think that this is a political project uh, ultimately, and you know what what's given me more hope uh, is. You know, it may sound weird because people have also asked me, like, how, you know, what kind of policies would fight conspiracy theory? And they're thinking, you know, they're thinking about uh, about laws to govern the platform economy and and ways that we can censor speech and things like that. And, you know, I'm never that comfortable with that. Um, but I where 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 I really have felt like this is something is when the auto workers went on strike and I and I saw. Sean Fain, the president of the auto workers, you know, on every network saying, you know, we're going to go after the bosses and the elites, you know, who've made all this money off of our backs and we're going to get our share. Real economic populism, I actually think, is the best way to start to fight fake economic populism. <laughs> in, in this book, you're very much about making connections, about taking a number of different and disparate trends and drawing them together. In a in a book that looks critically at conspiracy theories, where you're trying to find those patterns that explain what's going on, how hard do you have to work to not make that pattern recognition itself sound like a conspiracy? Yeah, I mean, I think it is really important that we draw a sharp distinction between honest efforts to expose real conspiracies, which I believe in. And, and if that, and if there's something wrong with that, then all investigative journalists are out of work. That is what, that's what we're supposed to do. Right. Um, and so, you know, there are real conspiracies within capitalism, price fixing, corporate cover-ups, the CIA's long history of covert ops and, and dirty tricks. Um, that is real. And, and, you know, one of the things that we, you know, what I talk about when I talk about these kind of mirror games between left and right is sometimes we become so reactive that what that's just kind of like whatever they're for, we're against. And so if they're the conspiracy people, we become the the credulous people <laughs> like not, there, there are, you know, and we suddenly we're sort of acting as if there are no conspiracies. Um, there are real ones. They're less sensational. They're more boring, you know, like 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 copper companies really did uh, collude with the CIA to destabilize Salvador Allende's government so that you know they he wouldn't nationalize the copper mines. That's less sensational than there's a cabal of you know Davos elites who want to drain children of their adrenochrome. Um, but it's still some a conspiracy that they tried to keep from the public and that we now can confirm thanks to dogged investigative journalism and freedom of information requests and. Do documents, more of which are still emerging 50 years later. So we, we need to distinguish between that and the work of exposing that and dishonest conspiracy fabulous and influencers who are spreading unproven and often contradictory claims for clout and cash and also political power. And that is how I would describe the mirror world. Mm -hmm. uh, conspiracy influencers, conspiracy, um, you know, fabulous. Um, and they are kind of a doppelganger of investigative journalism. Like they, they have a few of like the, they use the conventions, the containers, the lingo, but they leap over the guardrails that good investigative journalism and good academic research has to make sure that you check yourself, right? You, that you show your work that just because it feels true doesn't mean you have proved it. Um, so I, I mean, that, what else can we do but show our work as researchers, you know? But it's a good question. It's a really good question. And I asked myself, um, you know, I, I tried to check my to make sure that I still, you know, b believed what I'd written in the past. I mean, I, um, but I don't want to give that up, you know, and I think I think things things become dangerous when we get so reactive that we're like, okay, we're, you know, they're conspiracy people, we are people who believe there are no conspiracies. In an interview with uh, Gia Tolentino, 
you said that you felt that writing this book was more relaxing than writing your other books because this one could only be written by you. You share a lot about your personal life in it. I I assume that you have a you know, at this point in your career a fairly well established set of practices for writing a book. Mm-hmm. Did this book need you to write it differently than how you normally work, than how you approach a project like this? Yeah, so everything about it was different um, in that every book I've written since No Logo, including No Logo, um, I, 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 I had a, my process was I wrote probably one or two long magazine pieces um, that may, that may have had like, you know, the kernel of the thesis or a big piece of the reporting. Um, And then I wrote like a 40 page proposal and detailed chapter by chapter outline. And then I took the proposal to an agent and they took it to publishers. And, um, and then I had a fear of God deadline hanging over my head where I had to write it because I said I would with this book. It was an entirely secret project um, until I'd written 10 chapters because I wanted to make sure that I could get out of it if it turned out that I hadn't pulled off this kind of difficult thing that I had, was trying to do, which was use my own doppelganger to talk about doublings of various kinds, our personal branding and the fascist doubles of our nations. And um, I honestly wasn't sure that I had the chops as a writer to do it, you know, and I wanted to... To, to see if I could pull it off before I even told an agent it existed. Um, so, so it was this secret project that I was doing off the side of my desk. I had this, I had a window between my job at Rutgers and starting at UBC where I was able to work on this. Um, at, but yeah, everything about it was different. It was, it was, it was, it was a guilty pleasure instead of this thing that I had to do because I said I would. <laughs> Further along the lines of relaxing, you also write about wanting to induce calm in the reader to not provoke the kind of high adrenaline reaction that seems to drive you know, so much of especially our social media world and the mirror world. That was a surprising thing to read from an author that I think readers associate with activism, you know, lace up, you know, grab your picket sign and let's get out there for the cause. Why in this case is calmness so important? Well, you know, I think that um, even though I, people do associate me with that sort of rallying figure, um, it, my books are pretty sort of meticulous. And I'm, I've always been, I think, careful to to keep by that, that sort of rallying impulse. I mean, there, there's rallying moments, but um, I try not to write from a place of anger. Um, I think the whole point of mapping of, you know, creating maps of our political moment, which is what I try to do is to become oriented, you know, to, 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 you know, to, to, to have something more solid, uh, um, uh, you know, a little piece of earth that we, that we understand and that we can stand on because how else do we confront, you know, um, these, these huge forces. So um, I wasn't conscious that that's what I was, I I know that I knew that I was trying to, to, to use writing to call myself, but I received this reaction when I wrote the shock doctrine, which was an angry book. You know, I sometimes say that I wrote the shock doctrine with a clenched, with a my, holding my pen in a clenched fist, that it was, you know, I was back from Iraq. I, you know, I was, I, um, you know, it's, a, it's about, it's about torture. I mean, it is, it's, it's a very distressing book. Um, it was a distress. It's a distressing book to read. It's a distressing book to write. Um, but it is an attempt to, to map, like to tell a story of how we ended up with an economic model that that many people opposed at every turn, but that but which was sold to us as having been um, something that we all wanted, that it was freedom and democracy hand in hand, that it was that free markets and, and democracy hand in hand. And so th- it's an alternative history of, of neoliberalism told through a series of shocks. And when I sent the book to John Berger, you know, who's a literary hero of mine, the late John Berger, um, 
he, you know, and I sent it to him cold. I hadn't had any contact with him before. And he wrote back to me that it, that it instilled in him a sense of calm. And it was such an extraordinary thing, <laughs> you know, um, uh, to hear that from him. And I think, you know, part of it was I was writing about a lot of events that he had lived through, right? And so there's something really frantic making about uh, about false histories uh, existing, right? Uh, and and not being and being left unchallenged. But um, yeah, that was more than a blurb for me. You know, I mean, it was a blurb, but I it was also kind of became a bit of a mantra that like that is what the work is. It's not to tell people to calm down. But it, but but that if we can have a logical, ordered analysis, it can give people the kind of calm in the storm that they need to act rationally and well. Um, because if we're in a state of panic, we can't make good decisions, right? That's why the shock doctrine works. When we're panicked, we can't think right. Naomi, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. I have been speaking with Naomi Klein author of Doppelganger, A Trip into the Mirror World. Find it and all the books we've spoken about at Kobo and Conversation's home on the web, kobo.com slash conversation. Check the show notes for a link. And if you enjoyed this one, that probably means your doppelganger won't, but share it with them anyway. It's the thought that counts. And in case it has ever been unclear, Kobo and Conversation is produced and hosted by two completely different bearded Torontonians, Nathan Maharaj and me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening.